the protagonist of the novel is married to an American man and thinks he, she's perfectly adjusted to this culture. But at one point, a restlessness for her own past begins to set in. She goes to Iran for a visit after many years. At first, she feels like a foreigner there, but then she gets involved in searching for her mother, whom she had lost, she thought she had lost as a child. She finds her mother, and then she begins to question her happiness in the United States. The emotions behind the novel are autobiographical, though the specific details and characters are a conglomerate of a lot of experiences and people. At some point, when I had many more distance from some of the incidents in my own life, I had an urgency to write about them in a memoir form, which, uh, which is this Persian girls. I found out that to write a memoir was actually harder than writing fiction, in that when I came across certain plot line, line obstacles, I couldn't just make it up. After all, my intention was to finally tell the truth. Well, since I'm going to be just reading a few fragments from Persian Girls, I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis of it so these fragments make sense. Persian Girls extends from the time of the late Shah to present day in Iran and goes back and forth between Iran and America. I developed my relationship with my aunt Maryam, who adopted me from my mother when I was six months old, and with my birth mother after my father forcefully took me back from my aunt when I was nine years old. A big part of Persian Girls is also focused on the stories of my sister Paris and my own lives in Iran. And then as we took different paths, she, remained in, she remaining in Iran and I coming to America. When I started living with my birth family, I became very close to my older sister, Perry. We both resisted the roles prescribed for us for our parents, our school, and the wider society. She wanted to become an actress and I a writer both considered undesirable for one reason or another. Then I managed to come to America while Perry got trapped in a bad marriage and had to give up her aspiration to become an actress and all the independence she was striving for. After I had been in the US for many years, I got a phone call that Perry had fallen down the stairs of her house and died. I was married then and had a child and was involved in writing and teaching, but I dropped everything and went to Iran to find out more about what happened to Perry. I knew it was a murder because she was with her friends when she fell, but I fear it could have been self-inflicted since she had been depressed about her life for a long time. So now I'm going to read uh, a few pages from chapter one when I'm still living with my aunt in, a, in an old-fashioned section of Tehran. The day began like any other day. I woke to the voice of the Muazzin calling people to prayers, Allahu Akbar. After Maryam finished praying, we had our usual breakfast, sangak bread still warm from the stone oven it was baked in, jam that Maryam made herself with pears and plums, mean scented tea. On the way to Tehrani Elementary School, I stopped at my friend Batu's house at the mouth of the alley to pick her up. We passed the public baths and the mosques, sites visible on practically every street in Ghanad Abad neighborhood. It was a crisp, cool autumn day. The red fruit on persimmon trees on the sidewalks were glistening like jewels in sunlight. Water gargled in tubes running alongside the streets. The tall Albert's mountains surrounding Tehran were clearly delineated in the distance. We paused at the stall to buy sliced hot beets and ate them as we walked on. At a glass, class recess, as I stood with Batul and a few other girls, under a large maple tree in the courtyard, I noticed a man approaching us. He was thin and short, with a pock-marked face and a brush mustache. 
He was wearing a suit and a tie. Even from a distance, he seemed powerful. Don't you recognize your father? He asked as he came closer. In a flash, I recognized him, the man I had met only once when he came to Mariam's house with my birth mother on one of her visits. I was afraid of my father, a fear I had learned from Mariam. Having adopted me informally, Mariam didn't have legal right to me. Even if she did, my father would be able to claim me. In Iran, fathers were given full control of their children, no matter what the circumstance. There was no way to fight it if he wanted me back. To make matters worse, my father was also a judge. So often, Maryam had said to me, be careful, don't go away with a stranger. Most father, the stranger she had been warning me against, our worst fears were coming true. Let us go, he said, I'm taking you to Ahbaz. He took my hand and led me forcefully towards the outside door. Nahid, Nahid, Patul and my other classmates were calling after me. I turned around and saw they were frozen in place, too stunned to do anything but call my name. Does my mother know about this, I asked once we were on the street. My heart was beating violently. You mean your aunt, he said. I just sent a message to her. By the time she knows, we'll be on the airplane. I want my mother, I pleaded. We are going to your mother. I spoke to your principal. You aren't going to this school anymore. You'll be going to a better one, a private school in Ahbaz. I tried to free myself, but he held my arm firmly and pulled me towards Qanat Abad Avenue. Still holding me with one hand, he held the taxi with the other. One stopped and my father lifted me into the back seat and got in next to me, pinning my, pinning my legs down with his arm. Let me go, let me go, I screamed. Through the window, I saw a white chador with polka dot design in the distance. It was Maryam. Mother, mother, as the car car approached the woman, approached the woman, I realized it was Marian. Don't put up a fight, my father said, as the cab zigzagged through the hectic Tehran traffic. I, I won't do, it won't do you any good. Before I knew it, we were in the airport and then on the plane. The stewardess brought trays of food and put them in front of us. I picked up a fork and played with the pieces of rice and stew on my plate, taking reluctant bites. I have to go to the bathroom. Go ahead, my father replied. The toilet is in the back, the student said. I must hold it at, until I get to the toilet, I said to myself. But my stomach tightened sharply and I began to throw up in the aisle. The stewardess gave me a bag and I turned towards the bathroom with it pressed against my lips. When I returned, the stewardess had cleaned up the aisle. How do you feel, father asked. Better? I didn't answer. You'll be fine when we get home. Your real home, father said, crossing, caressing my arm. My mother, sisters, and brothers are all waiting for me, for you, and I'll look after you. Finally, I fell asleep. When I awoke, we were in the Ahwaz airport. I was groggy and disoriented as we rode in a taxi. Flames erupted from a tall tower, burning excess gas from the Ahwaz petroleum fields. A faint smell of petroleum filled the air. We passed narrow streets lined by mud and straw houses and tall date and coconut palms. Stop right here, father said to the driver as we entered the square. The taxi came to a halt in front of a large modern two-story house with a wrap-around balcony and two entrances. We are home, father said. I felt an urge to bolt, but father, as if aware of that urge, took hold of my hand and grasping it firmly, he led me into the house. 
A woman was sitting in a shady corner of the courtyard holding a glass of lemonade, holding lemonade with ice jingling in it. She wore bright red lipstick and her hair in a permanent wave. She looked so different from Maryam, who wore no makeup and her naturally wavy hair let, it, let her naturally wavy hair grow long. Here is Nahid, Mohtaram June. We have our daughter back with us, my father said to her. Mohtaram, my birth mother. She nodded vaguely and walked over to where we were standing. She took me in her arms, but her embrace was tentative, hesitant. I missed Mariam's firm, loving arms around me. Ali, show her to her room, Mohtaram said to the living servant, who came out of her room in the corner. Go ahead, father said to me. You can rest for a while. This is a few pages later. The next morning, Ali called me down to breakfast with my parents and siblings. My mother spoke of the day ahead, the ceaseless chores, something to be bought for one child, something else for another. I had just arrived, and yet it seemed that I was the one she was complaining about, as if I had somehow tipped the scales and now she had far too many children. I looked to my siblings for solace, but none let their eyes rest on me, except for my sister, Perry, who stared at me with curiosity, a look that would blossom into love. Now all my children are here with us, father said, trying to pull me in, his stern face brightening. <clears throat> this is from another chapter a little later. My new home was chaotic, filled with clashing and conflicting mixture of traditional Iranian Muslim customs and values and Western ones. None of us prayed, followed the hijab or fast, but my parents believed boys and girls shouldn't mingle with the opposite sex until they were married by the religious law, that marriages should be arranged by parents that, un that unmarried girls shouldn't draw boys' attention to themselves by wearing makeup or suggesti <coughs> suggestive bright colored clothes, that education was for their sons. Daughters should marry as soon as a suitable man came along. Tension from unexpressed desire permeated our household. Desire of any kind for more clothes a different kind of clothing, to, say, to be able to say certain things, to be with a particular person. The mixture of values at home mirrored the ones among the people of Ahwaz. Ahwaz's population, consisting of a few thousand Americans and English, about 70,000 Iranians and a few hundred Arabs, mainly immigrants from Iraq, was an amalgam of modern and the old-fashioned. There was a great deal of antagonism in the city among the people with opposing views. There were the con conservative Iranians and the half-westernized ones, like my parents. Then there were the Americans and English employed by the oil refineries. But to mention, not to mention the Arab immigrants who were Sunnis, in the midst of Shia Iranians, they mingled in uncomfortable ways. As people lined up in front of the cinema that showed American movies, a mosque across the street broadcast a sermon warning people against worldly pleasures, such as seeing movies. Men and women were forbidden to each other, and yet romantic songs were always blaring out of radios. Okay, now this is uh, later on in the book. It was Friday, the Sabbath in Iran. I found Perry in her room, getting dressed, putting on a blue dress and gold jewelry. A suitor is here himself with his sister, she said. Mohtaram and father made me dress up. They're going to call me in to meet them. 
I saw him going into the, into the room. He looks really tense. You want to see what he looks like? We crept slowly to the salon and took turns peeking through the large keyhole. Our parents were sitting on the maroon velvet sofa. The suitor and his sister occupied the two dark blue matching armchairs. Look how his ears stick out, Parry whispered. Everything he did, all his gestures, seemed comic as I saw him through Parry's eyes. We crept back to Parry's room as we couldn't hold back laughter. Moments later, father came to the, to the door. Come with me, he said. Parry followed him. The air in Parry's room still had a faint scent of the flowers she received from Majid, a man she was in love with. And here she was, pressured to be viewed by a suitor, soon perhaps to be pressured to consider him as a husband, someone she had absolutely no interest in. How ridiculous and unfair all this was. After the visitors left, I heard angry voices on the porch. I don't want to marry him, Parry said. Come on, come to your senses, father boomed. Tahiri is one of the richest men in Ahwaz. He has a share in the Dorang Petrochemical Company, and he'll inherit a fortune from his elderly father, who has a thriving business in Tehran. And he's educated, a graduate of the Tehran, of the Finance Academy in Tehran. He values you so much, he's offering a large sum of mehriye for you, Mohtaram said. You can't throw that away. You're trying to sell me, Parry protested. Parry, don't be so foolish, father said. You aren't thinking of me at all. Seconds later, Parry was back in her room. What happened, I asked her. I'm not going to give in to them, she said. I'm in love with Majid. But Tahiri was persistent. Since his parents lived in Tehran, his oldest sister, Behjad, was the one who mainly dealt with our parents. She was a widow and lived with her, and lived with her brother. He planned to sell the shop in Ahwaz and live in Tehran to be near his elderly parents. One afternoon when Behjad was, was sitting with Mohtaram in the salon, Pari and I went to the keyhole again, looking in and listening. My brother is an open-minded man, Behjad was telling Mohtaram. He doesn't want a chaudhuri wife. He doesn't even like me to wear this headscarf. He wants a wife who can dress well, like your daughter. When he first saw your daughter on the way to school, he knew immediately she is the one for him. Mohtaram came to Pari after Behjad left and they had the same argument as before, with Pari refusing to give in to the marriage proposal. Behjad visited a few days later, and Pari and I again took our spot by the hall. This time, father was there with Behjad and Mohtaram. My brother is threatening suicide, Behjad said. He said if your daughter doesn't consent, he would rather be dead. Tahiri has a romantic soul. I admit my daughter is headstrong, father said. Bear with her. She'll come to her senses. I felt anxiety at the bottom of my stomach from all the tension building up around Pari. Pari, father called from behind the door. I sat there, wondering what was going to happen. Is Parry going to keep arguing until Father and Mariam give up? Fathers keep telling me Tahiri, Father is telling me Tahiri is too good a catch, Parry said, coming into the room again. Why can't he listen to me? My emotions are all tangled up with Majid. You know what Miss Partovi says, that a good actress should be able to present characters so that all different aspects of them come together in a coherent way. I want that for myself, but I feel so fragmented under all the pressure. What Parry just said only added to my 
trepidation. It was as if she had turned into a delicate vase that might suddenly break into pieces. <coughs> uh, so now I'm going to go to uh, somewhere further on in the, in the book. Uh, when I have fought with my parents after my two older sisters got married and they were trying to, I was, I was next in line to have an, an arranged marriage for, and I started arguing with my father, particularly who was in control of everything, to send me to the U.S. where my brothers had come before me to go to school. And my father finally agreed to let me go um, under the condition that I go to an all-woman's college and near one of my brothers. And that was the only condition I could come here. And as it turned out, this college, which was near one of my brothers who was going to medical school in St. Louis, gave me a full scholarship. So this was the college I ended up going to. <clears throat> my isolation initially felt like freedom, but soon the reality of the college and my separation from the other students began to hit me. Beauty contests, mixtures with boys, the school invited from colleges in the area, sermons in the Presbyterian channel to which attendance was required, no matter what our religion, all just floated around us without meaning, around me without meaning. The ideal young girl, one whom their staff and parents approved of and promoted, was a good Christian, dressed properly, was agreeable and sociable, if a student didn't go to on frequent dates with boys, she was antisocial or a loser. If a student had plans with a female friend and then a boy called and asked her out at the same time, she would automatically accept the date and cancel plans with the girlfriend. If a student dated a boy from outside her religion, it created problems. Smiling was compulsory. One girl in my dormitory said smile every time I passed, we passed each other in the hall. The pocket money my father sent me through my brother shrunk when converted from two months to dollars. The other girls flew home often for family gatherings or to reunite with high school sweethearts. They had their hair done in expensive beauty salons in St. Louis then went shopping and returned with packages of hats, gloves, blouses, shoes. They often skipped dormitory meals to buy their own food. The girls who didn't have cars took taxis everywhere rather than buses, which ran frequent, infrequently on limited routes. They decorated their rooms with their own personal furniture. I was out of the prison of my home but then I was here all alone. I didn't know a single other person. One day towards the end of the semester, I found a note from the dean in my mailbox. She was inviting me along with other three foreign students on the campus to participate in, in Parents' Day and asked that I stop by in her office. The dean was wearing a linen suit, her blonde hair set in neat, short curves. She greeted me with a, with a warm, cheerful smile. I'm telling this to all foreign students on the campus, she said, that you should wear your native costume on Parents' Day. I was silent, feeling awkward. I had no costume. She was waiting. In Iran, some women cover themselves in chadors, but they wear them on top of regular clothes similar to what people wear here, I said. Then wear the chador, she said. My awkwardness, my awkwardness was increasing. I never wore one in Iran, I said finally, my voice drowning in the sound of laughter and conversation in the hall. I still want you to wear it for this occasion, to show a little of your culture to us, she said, smiling cheerfully. 
to me, chador had come to me in a kind of bondage. It felt ridiculous to wear it in this American college. Maybe I can think of something else to, to wear, I mumbled. No, no, the idea of the chador is excellent. I have seen pictures of women in the Islamic countries wearing them. It fascinates me. What's the point? Well, in Islam, exposed hair and skin is considered to be seductive to men, I explained. I wish I could feel my hair and skin are so seductive that I would have to cover them up, she said with a chuckle. But her attempt at humor only made me more insecure in this unexpectedly alien environment. I was realizing quickly how different from my expectation of America this place was. <clears throat> this is now a little later. As I trudged through my days in a place where I didn't fit, I tried to focus on my future. I would go somewhere in America where I could blend in more, though I had no idea yet where that was or who I would or how I would get there. I thought about what Mariam had said to me. As soon as a baby comes into the world, an angel writes its destiny on its forehead. I hadn't accepted that as a child, and now too I believed that it had been my own sheer determination that enabled me to come to America. I should be able to determine what I would do next. I reminded myself of the luxury of being able to read and write what I wanted without father's vigilant eyes on me or the fear of Savak, the Shah's secret police in my heart. Late at night, I turned to my writing, my long-lasting friend. I wrote in English now, though I had to constantly look up words in a dictionary. Even though no one was watching me, Fear of discovery still attacked me at times, as if father or a Savag agent were lurking in the dark. Writing in English gave me a freedom I didn't feel in Farsi, yet everything I wrote, uh, it had to do with people I knew growing up. Though Iran and people in it were out of reach in this college, as if in a different lifetime, they occupied my deepest emotions. Okay, I'm going to stop reading now, and I let you ask me questions. <laughs> you mean, why did my mother gave me to my aunt? Yes. Well, it, it's a very complicated issue that I have tried to develop in these Persian girls because it wasn't so straightforward. But the main thing, they, the main uh, explanation they gave me was that my aunt had been asked, my aunt was married but couldn't get pregnant, and then she was divorced. And my mother gave birth to 10 children. And my aunt has been, had been always asking my mother to give her one of her children to raise and basically be her child. And when it came to this pregnancy, my mother just gave in and gave me to my aunt. But I also have other theories that have developed in my memoir. Well, the reason I refer to her as Mohtaram in the book to make it clear for the reader, because so... Yeah, but you refer to your father as father. We never know her his first. Yeah. Well, the reason is because I had two mothers. Right. One was Maryam, was, was Mohtaram. So I wanted to distinguish them by their names. Because I consider my aunt really to be my mother. That's true. And always address her as mother. Yes. So I didn't want to create confusion here. Well, you know what? There are a lot of these mores and costumes that are practiced to different degrees in Iran and a lot of the Middle East. Uh, depends on where they are living, the level of education, the local, you know, like, they are not that uniform. Even, like, if you go to Iran from village to village, people practice their own kind of laws. And sometimes the local government of that town enforces certain laws that are not necessarily like law, the real laws in Iran. No, no, in Iran there are no Sunnis actually. Okay. Iran is like 99% Shias, yeah. so it's not that different. It's just that just so. villages have their own customs and they have 
things that have been handed down to them for many years. Like if they're living in an area which is Zoroastrian background, they have a little bit of a different attitude, or the ones near the Caspian Sea with Russian influence, they have somewhat a different way of doing things. And the central law, which is, you know, like the real law, doesn't always apply to these villages because some of these governors, local governors, take the law into their own hand and is allowed to do that in Iran. That's why, like for instance, when you hear some judge in a tiny village order the stoning of this woman, that's not commonplace. And it doesn't happen everywhere in Iran. Maybe it happens one in like 10 years in some village. But when you read it like in newspapers here, it seems like that's the law. But it really isn't. That is not a law in Iran. I was 17. I was 17 and my brother actually was six, seven years older than me. And uh, my father thought my brother would be looking after me and protecting me. Well, as it turned out, he, was, he wasn't doing that. Because first of all, my father didn't realize the distance between this college I was in and my brother's was still a two hour drive. And my brother was very busy as a first year medical student. He didn't have time to constantly come supervise me. And thirdly, he had become very Americanized. He had an American girlfriend. He believed in dating. He believed, he had become very Americanized. So he didn't fulfill what my father was expecting. But my father was so far away, he just put me in the hand of my brothers. But my brother did protect me if I had needs of certain kinds, like if the money didn't arrive on time from Iran or things like that, he, would, he was protective that way. How did, did it change for them? Well, see, my parents, um, when you say progressive, they were so mixed. There was nobody in Iran that was 100% American, Americanized, or 100% what they call modernized. Like my father, in spite of the fact that he was a judge, very highly educated, he knew French, he knew this, he knew that. His, his office was filled with all these legal books. He still believed in arranged marriage. He still believed uh, girls should behave very differently from boys. Uh, so it's not that they were so modernized in that sense. They were just kind of a mixture of things, as the majority of Iranians were and are now too. As far as their feelings about the Shah and the new regime, I think they probably preferred the Shah's regime only because they didn't force my mother to cover up her hair and th those inconveniences. But other than that, they just stayed out of politics altogether. It was very scary to take sides in Iran at eat any time. In fact, one of the reasons my father agreed to send me to the US was because at that time, the secret police, which was the Shah secret police, put there actually by the American CIA, was very, very powerful and very, very restrictive. And they, they were just, and the Shah was very insecure at that time because there were all these other forces trying to push him out of his throne, of his throne. And so I was very rebellious and I was writing these little pieces of writing and giving these little talks. And one of my pieces was read on the public radio. And all of these things make my father very frightened because anything could be misinterpreted as anti-government. Like anything you wrote that wasn't if it was realistic, it was considered anti-government. You were supposed to glorify everything, like not show any realistic picture of anything, but put everything as if you're writing a travelogue, uh, make everything like no mosquitoes in the air, no dirt on the floor. If you put that in your story, that means you're anti-government. That means you think the Shah's attempts at modernization has failed, or beautification of Iran, because one of his goals was beautify Iran, make it the Switzerland of the Middle East. So if you wrote things like that, it meant that you were opposing the Shah. Also, I was reading all these censored books. Everything was censored. So I had befriended this um, 
a bookstore man who, after he trusted me, he would sell me censored books. And my father caught me with some of those, and that really frightened him too. And he said, this daughter is going to get us into trouble, and I'm going to lose my license. At that point, he thought he better give to pressure and send me to the US and remove me from that atmosphere so I won't create any problems of that nature. What happened? Oh, she married that guy, and he turned out to be very abusive. It was a terrible disaster. I got a divorce eventually. Did she ever marry the one she wanted? No, she never married the one she wanted to. Because then by then it was too late. That was years later when she got divorced. I have gotten letters from some Iranian American editors who live here, but they know both languages fluently, and they were visiting in Iran, and they wanted to get this book translated and published. Didn't pass the censorship. None of my books have passed the censorship for the reasons that I said. It's not that they're directly anti-government, but in a culture like Iran, everything is interpreted anti-government unless you're writing a travelogue and making everything like, wow, yeah, everything is wonderful there. That's true about under both regimes. So they don't understand the concept of writing. It's, that's why Salman Rushdie was put under death sentence. Like, they, don't, uh, they are not for free expression of any kind. So that's why it has never been translated. Though oddly, it has been translated into Arabic, and it's doing extremely well in the Arabic countries. And after I saw all those people overthrowing their government in Egypt, I understood why they like books like this. Because they are not pro, pro that system that oppresses them. This book actually was published in Lebanon and then distributed to the other Arabic countries. In Iran, where there have been some revolts, but they have been put down all the time, so they haven't become widespread. Yeah, there is always some tension, some demonstrations, but so far it hasn't become like massive. In Farsi, I will always had to hide what I was writing from my father or from everybody. Like, I was living with these taboos that I shouldn't say this word is bad, that word is bad. And also, I was always afraid someone is looking at them and interpreting them. Writing English, I just felt like suddenly free, as if like I could express myself really well in it, because I, it didn't, I didn't associate it with those taboos and fears. It just seems like I felt much more liberated writing English. Oddly, after all these years, I still feel the same way after so many years. Literary influences, well, you know what, I have had a lot of literary influences, but I can't say who is the most influential on me, because since high school, I was reading all these books in translations, like Dostoevsky and Balzac and Hemingway, all these foreign these people who were foreign in Iran translated, and many of them were censored, but I would get it from this bookstore. So I was fascinated by all those books, novels from foreign countries. And then since I came here, I'm always reading everything that gets published, gets good reviews, I read them. So all of these things, as a writer, you're influenced by what you read somewhat. But I, would, I couldn't single out one particular author, and so I was influenced by that author. I, I read all these books by Iranians that get published. I've read every one of them, because I want to see what they are writing. <laughs>